Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming back from coffee. Great to be with you. And thank you to John Huff and the panel that set up the uh, first session of the day, which I think was a really nice segue into what we are going to discuss this morning, So, which is around climate change risk and particular emphasis on the TCFD implementation around governance, strategy, risk management, metrics and disclosure of all of the above. Uh, so I just wanted to make some introductory remarks to set the panel up prior to introducing my esteemed panel. And I'll start by saying at this event last year in Moscow, uh, we, we being the IAIS, released the first issues paper uh, on climate-related risks to the insurance sector. And we did that in uh, cooperation with the Sustainable Insurance Forum, which is a group of about uh, 25 insurance regulators, all of whom are IAS members. Um, and the IAS uh, collaborates on sustainability issues, helping to raise uh, understanding and capability within our membership. And the Sustainable Insurance Forum and the IAS released this issues paper last year, which was well received, um, and it was designed to raise uh, awareness and understanding for not only regulators, but the insurance sector about the effects of physical transition and liability risk to the insurance sector. The last 12 months has seen quite a paradigm shift uh, in the response of regulators globally across all sectors uh, to the issue of climate change risk. Um, that is because regulators see the risk as being uh, particularly pertinent to their mandate, that those risks are distinctly financial in nature, that those risks are material, foreseeable and actionable now, and uh, bodies such as the IAS, the Network for Greening the Financial System, uh, central banks and supervisors are all really ramping up their engagement uh, on climate risk, and so thank you for your interest in the topic as well. I mentioned TCFD, uh, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, Disclosures, a mandate from the Financial Stability Board, uh, first released their report in uh, 2017, having released a draft of that report in 2016. And just this last week, on the 6th of June, they released a update uh, a report, which I'm just going to reference briefly. Um, it's, uh, it's worth having a look at. Uh, unfortunately, not enough insurers have had a look at the report. Um, so let me just give you some insights from what this uh, update report uh, found uh, across all sectors of the economy. This is a, uh, a document and an initiative that is a voluntary framework for disclosure of climate-related uh, risks and gives a, gives a framework for how firms across, as I said, all sectors of the economy could think about it. So these are the four themes that the, uh, that the TCFD found on their update report. First of those is that disclosure of climate-related financial information has increased but st since 2016, but still is insufficient for investors to make informed decisions. Secondly, they found that more clarity is needed on the potential financial impact of climate-related issues on companies. Thirdly, of the companies using scenarios, the majority do not disclose this information or the resilience of their strategies going forward. And fourthly, mainstreaming climate-related um, issues requires the involvement of a cross-sectoral uh, range of disciplines to help to improve uh, our understanding of the risk and the modelling, uh, taxonomy and stress testing of the risk. Now, somewhat disturbingly, and this is a, a wake-up call, I think, for the insurance sector, of the uh, eight sectors that were looked at um, in this report um, across, um, as I said, all sectors of the economy, Insurance was a laggard in terms of their adoption uh, of disclosures around governance, strategy, risk management and metrics. Um, we were grouped at the bottom of these eight sectors with the uh, technology and media sector um, lagging behind. In fact, uh, if you looked at the specifics of the insurance sector, there has not been a lot of change in terms of um, the results that insurers have shown uh, since 2016 when these... Uh, these, this, this survey was first done. So um, that is a wake-up call, and I want to, with a panel, dig into that in a little more detail. But just to reinforce that point, the Sustainable Insurance Forum, through our membership, has just completed a survey 
of, uh, of, of our, um, through our members of insurance firms globally. In fact, this was done across 15 jurisdictions. We had some 1,200 responses to our, to our survey. And um, uh, we are meeting tomorrow uh, as a forum to dig into and understand these results in a little more detail. But I'm happy to share with you some initial uh, insights from the data that we've collected. And those are that while 74% of firms by number, or indeed 93% of firms by size in terms of the largest firms, uh, have identified that climate-related financial risk is material to their organisation, only 26% of firms, or, or a much larger than uh, 69% of firms by size, um, are doing anything about disclosing uh, that, that, that risk. In fact, uh, only 24% of firms by number were even aware of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures uh, framework. Uh, pl somewhat pleasingly, the larger firms uh, showed a much better response. But it shows that uh, the, uh, the engagement around disclosure and understanding and modelling the, the risks uh, is, is low. In fact, even more disturbing, only 11% of firms by number uh, said that they had any plans to implement any form of um, uh, disclosure going forward. So um, with our panel this morning, we want to uh, understand why that is the case and why there is this uh, dis uh, dichotomy, if you like, of firms saying that climate-related financial risk is material to their organisations, but there is a lack of take-up in terms of disclosing that risk um, uh, publicly and some question marks about what has been done internally in those firms around modelling and scenario testing. So that is the subject of our discussion this morning um, and we look forward to not only talking with the panel but also engaging with you, the audience, through the polling mechanisms and also the, the uh, opportunity to do uh, some Q&A. So let me introduce um, uh, my fellow panellists. Uh, so uh, first of all, um, uh, from uh, my immediate left uh, to your right, we have um, uh, Mary Frances Munro, who is a senior advisor uh, on insurance and, lead reg and, and regulatory affairs with the International Institute of Finance. Uh, welcome, Mary Frances. Next to Mary Frances is Kajitan uh, Chais, uh, who is a program director of sustainable finance at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership. Uh, welcome, Kajitan. Uh, we then have uh, uh, Suzette Volgesan, who's head of banking, insurance, and uh, FMI supervision at the Prudential Authority of the South Australian, uh, South Australia, South African Reserve Bank. Uh, uh, my Australian heritage is, is slipping up there. Apologies, uh, Suzette. And Suzette is also a deputy chair of the IAS and a member of the Sustainable Insurance Forum. And lastly, at the end, is uh, Hugh Francis, who's director of external reporting developments with Aviva. So welcome to the panel. So we'd like to uh, start by exploring uh, where have we come from on disclosure and why is this dichotomy from... Um, uh, that we have around firms saying that this is an issue for firms, but then there is a lack of uh, talking about this publicly and some question mark about what's been done internally. So, Kajitan, uh, the, the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership, and I know you have been reviewing uh, this for some time. Tell us about the history of disclosure as it relates to climate risk and uh, what's some of the background before we dig into uh, where we are today. Thank you, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to attend uh, this conference. Um, so, if you look at um, how long we've been at this, uh, we've been disclosing uh, climate change-related information for at least 35 years. So, some of the companies and some of the funds um, that uh, are in the market are that, that old. Actually, uh, CISL as an institute um, is now 30 years old. So, we've been uh, kind of training leaders in this field, uh, and I've actually come from uh, our, our birthday party at uh, Buckingham Palace yesterday with uh, our, our patron, uh, the Prince of Wales, um, to, to celebrate that. And, and there's been a lot achieved, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, and I think when I, when I look back at the history of how this field has evolved, I do see three distinct uh, elements to it. I think 
up until uh, the 2010s, this has been very much uh, a kind of ethical values uh, based field where uh, it was dominated by ethical investment funds, um, and where um, companies were, were looked at from that perspective and you'd, you would screen out companies dealing with arms, tobacco, um, and high carbon emitting sectors because that was quote unquote bad. Uh, I think what happened uh, after the Copenhagen summit uh, in 2009 and around uh, 2010, 2011, is that uh, you had more, uh, you, had, you had the development of the carbon market in the EU after 2005, which created a, a fungible unit that you could compare companies with uh, the tons of carbon, uh, tons of carbon dioxide. Um, and because there was a regulatory framework, you could begin uh, assessing the relative risks, the climate change risks associated with companies and their assets. So you started uh, getting quite um, advanced econometric modeling around how companies will fare in different regulatory regimes that were already in place or that were, were beginning to, to be in place, being put in place. And then I think the third phase really kicked in in late 2015 when we had the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals and in December that year, uh, the Paris Agreement, where the whole uncertainty of whether or not the world as a whole and policymakers will, will, move, will want to move to a low carbon uh, mode of production and consumption, that uncertainty was effectively solved and the penny I, I felt dropped and uh, more and more companies were focused on, okay, what do we do about the solving the problem rather than assessing just the risks. So it moved from a risk to, a, um, to, a, uh, to an opportunities focus. However, there still remains a very large chunk, as we've, we've seen by the numbers coming out of the TCFD, where, uh, of, of the market that show that we're not quite there yet. Um, so what does that mean? What does, what does it mean to be actually there yet? Well, um, you've, you've, you've actually mentioned it. It means that the data coming from companies, including from the financial sector, is good enough to make financial decisions against, right? So if, I think if, if, there's, if there's one thing that I'd like you to take away from today is that climate change does present financial risks. And there's a distinction between you know, values-based investment and just pure investment that takes, that takes and should take into account the financial risks of climate change. We'll be talking about some methodologies uh, of how do you assess those uh, later today. Thank you. Um, I mean, we are, um, sound like we're being critical of the insurance sector here. Um, um, Mary Frances, uh, how do we, uh, you know, is, is in, it, I thought this is our core business as insurers, um, that we model risk and we understand risk. I mean, how does the insurance sector compare uh, through your organisation? You look cross-sectorally. How does it compare with uh, uh, banks, uh, investment firms, et cetera? What, what would you what perspective would you give on this? Thank you, Jeff, and thank you to the IAIS for the kind invitation to, uh, to speak on this panel today. Um, the IIF is a, a supporter of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, and we do have a, a working group on uh, climate-related disclosures that includes banks, asset managers, and insurers. And I would say that, that overall, uh, there is some very good progress being made across all of the sectors, but as, as you pointed out, Jeff, in your opening remarks, the insurance sector does lag behind other sectors and specifically behind the, uh, behind the banking sector in terms of climate-related financial disclosures, and I think this is an area for, for improvement. Uh, we, we do include a number of insurers on our, our climate-related uh, uh, subgroup, and I think that there's also a, a difference between the quality and level of disclosure among the leading global groups, uh, insurance groups, and uh, some, of the, some of the smaller insurers, and I think that that's a gap that through greater awareness and uh, through the dissemination of best practices, we are working on a paper uh, on what good disclosure looks like, uh, simple, effective, meaningful disclosures. Uh, this should help to, to close that gap. So, um, 
so you both, both make the point that the large firms um, and the more sophisticated firms are perhaps more evolved on this. If we, if we, if we take a, a more optimistic view of that, if I can just come back to both of you very briefly, then I want to ask the audience um, their perspective. Uh, are the largest insurers and reinsurers and the more sophisticated firms, how do they compare with the largest um, more sophisticated banks and, and, and investment firms? Uh, I mean, is there thought leadership in those organisations? Kajitan? I think there, there definitely is, and um, I don't want to kind of point fingers at um, companies that I'd consider leaders, um, but within the insurance sector, I think there definitely is. Um, I think one thing to bear in mind is that uh, leadership looks very different in depending on what sector you're in. Um, and in, in some especially heavy, heavily regulated uh, sectors, and, and the three that you mentioned differ in terms of how regulated they are. Um, there's, there's an approach, well, until I have to, I won't. And the largest, the largest companies, they do have spare cash to, put a, to, to invest into initiatives that they don't see critical. And I think that just shows that the industry as a whole hasn't really, hasn't had the penny drop moment, really, to use that phrase uh, again, where they, they see this as a way of differentiating themselves against their competitors and seeing this as a way of generating alpha for their investment uh, side or indeed better risk management for their underwriting side. I, I think there may also be a concern um, among insurers and, and firms in general about some of the potential risks of disclosing until they have really gotten a, a complete handle on the financial impact of climate risk. I think there's some uncertainty. Uh, there's certainly scarce data. Uh, there are uh, emerging methodologies and modeling techniques that haven't been fully developed. And I think firms are, are hesitant to, to make disclosures. They're, they're concerned that they may mislead their investors and stakeholders if they make disclosures until those uh, data points and methodologies are a little more mature. Uh, they may have some concern about regulatory risk as well. So this is very challenging because, of course, uh, the the risk is not behaving. Uh, the past is not a good predictor of the future. Um, the pathways are nonlinear, and the confluence of events. Uh, there's great uncertainty. But the longer the longer we don't disclose. Uh, the, the, it's a negative feedback loop, isn't it? So, yeah. But, ha, but how about you? Look, can I turn to the audience? Um, and if I could have the first polling question uh, put up. So I, I've you know, opened by saying that maturity uh, doesn't feel um, uh, where it should be in the sector as a whole. Um, here's your opportunity to anonymous, anonymously disclose where you think your organisation is or organisations that you are associated with uh, or, or aware of. Um, so just a reminder, the Wi-Fi password is Hilton2019. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, enter the code at the, at the top of the screen. And the, the first question uh, is, uh, how would you rate your organisation on its maturity of understanding of climate-related uh, financial disclosures, with um, one being most mature and five being the least mature? Well, so far it would indicate that the TCFD work and the Sustainable Insurance uh, Forum's work and survey work um, is mirrored in this, in this room. So, um, looks like a, a reasonable bell curve there with um, the vast majority saying not mature, although encouragingly uh, moderately mature, does, does uh, come in second. What if they, what's your reaction to that, uh, Kajitan? I think that's, that's roughly fair. Um, I guess there's a question of what moderately not mature means, whether or not that's less, that's somewhere in between not mature or other. But anyway, that, that's the marginal point. Um, I, I'd agree. I, th I think there's, there's quite a lot more, more to go. Um, and and it, it is quite a new field, of, uh, of analysis. So I think on the one hand, um, a lot of uh, insurance companies would feel that, okay, well, we do look at risk on a day-to-day -day basis, so surely we're catching this. 
Um, but as you say, these, these risks are very often nonlinear um, and, and they can creep in through the fat tail of risk. Um, on the other hand, it does require a bit of investment to get your head around what these risks are and how they relate to your underwriting policies and, and, and the assets that you invest in. Um, and that requires either buying that skill set in, which is an investment in itself, or incorporating it into your own company, which, again, creates this kind of barrier which needs to be overcome to, to actually make that investment. So that's the problem statement. Um, we have this um, material risk that's uh, foreseeable, that is actionable now. Um, uh, you know, the risk is often referred to as an existential risk um, uh, for, for society as a whole. Yet, uh, curiously, we aren't that evolved in terms of um, our maturity in thinking about the risks, disclosing and modelling that internally, or indeed informing our stakeholders externally about that. So let's move to uh, where are we now and what perhaps the opportunities. So, uh, Hugh, if I can ask you to, um, to come in here. I mean, you are with a large, sophisticated insurance firm, if I can uh, refer to Aviva as that. Um, and being such, I assume you have the resources to apply to this problem. How, how does Aviva think about it and what are, what are the opportunities of disclosure? I know your firm has done a reason amount in this area and, and how is that um, benefiting Aviva's objectives? Uh, I think it's important to differentiate the disclosure to whether companies are doing things. Right. If I start off to spice things up, if you introduce a TCFD and make it voluntarily, you then surprise that companies may or may not choose to do it. So if we were on the TCFD, we would have always made it mandatory in the first place, and then that question would have been different, but um, that's just a thought to start off with. Um, in relation to you know, companies, in terms of looking at, at these risks, for us, you know, insurance at the core is, is anticipating and managing risk. So it is a core competence, it's the core element of what we're about. Um, and so to us, as a Viva, the value of better understanding or exposure to these climates is that we're in a better position to basically uh, to understand the strategic challenges that the climate change uh, brings, and we can then prepare ourselves accordingly. So it's basically a bit of a no-brainer. Mm. What, what does that discussion look like? I mean, what, what, specifically for our audience, what, what are you doing? Uh, well, if I go through a little bit about how we do the risk management, I can come back and show a bit later on the disclosures. So that's all, I, I don't. I mean, the other thing, just point is, we we also do it because we fundamentally think it's the right thing to do. So you know, it is also driven by the fact that it's the best thing for our customers, our families, and for society at large. And we are uniquely placed on this, both on the liability and the asset side on that. So if I give you a, a bit more concrete example, if you take something as a basic core competency for risk management, you will do, you will internally want to do quantitative scenario analysis to look at these because it, pl it, it, it enables you to look at the world and think about under various scenarios what is the action is the sensible areas to take. So for example more tangibly, tangibly what we've been doing recently is uh, when the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change gave four scenarios uh, they're, they're quite different in nature and they give rise to different types of risks. So on the one hand you've got the 1.5 scenario which is where which is basically projecting what the scenarios are we could what path we'd get to to 2000 uh, to, to uh, the end of the century uh, would basically one where there's uh, a radical shift to transition quickly to the 1.5 at the other end there's the carry on what we're currently doing do very little and then we're going to be at four degrees and so in that context what we're very interested in looking at is how does that impact and what what would the world be like and what would happen during those processes and how would that impact us as a business so, for example, if you take uh, the move to the 1.5% scenario, that would involve a, an enormous change um, in CO2 emissions, basically slashing CO2 emissions by 2050 by, you know, between 65 and 90%. So, radically, the companies we're investing with are going to be changing the shape of those, are going to be changing um, uh, to... Uh, that means on investment side that the current levels of investment to sustain that would have to be five times what they currently are now by 2050. So, there's, so the shape of the world in which we're oper operating in would be very different. Um, and that's kind of like the transition risk point. Um, and we think it's really important to better understand that both on the investment side and also on the physical side. So for us, 
that's starting to drive action. So, you know, so we're, we're investing currently about 4.4 billion in green assets. We're looking committed to increase that because there are opportunities on technologies as well as there are, are threats even on, on the transition side. Um, if you then go to the four degree scenario where you're basically current path, you know, then clearly the dominant feature is the, uh, is the, is the physical risk. Uh, and and the, you know, the consequences of the things we've, we've seen and, uh, which are crystallizing now, whether it's rainfalls, flooding, extreme heat, wildflowers, and then that's linking into other things about does that displace populations? Does that basically lead to disease? Does that basically change mortality? So there are a whole range of scenarios which we think it's really important for us to look at. Um, now, on a certain way, on mitigating actions, you see, we've seen, seen that already in the UK with uh, flood, fl flood re-being created because are there certain homes that when you know where flooding is happening are going to become uninsurable? You know, uh, and so to us, it's, it's, it's very important to understand that because it allows us to shape our business strategically. Then you come to what's the financial impact, and what we do know is we don't know necessarily which scenario and path will go. We'll know whichever scenario it goes, it's going to radically impact or shape the environment we're operating in. So I think one of the challenges that we have is traditionally uh, our analysis and some of these areas have been backward looking. Actually, the challenge for us is probably how we make that more forward looking. But so um, Mary Francis said that uh, firms are often reluctant um, because of, uh, to disclose because of backlash from regulators, from investors um, and the like. You, your firm has disclosed. Um, do you want to comment on, on that fear? I personally think it's slightly irrational, but there we go. Um, I mean, I, I think we're also significant investors. We have, we, we want to disclose our own path. Well, I'll come back later to how, how, how we, our, our own journey. But, it, but ultimately, as investors, we also want to see what other people are doing as well. When you're making investments decisions, it's incredibly important. So we've been at the forefront, you know, we've been, as an investor, very engaged in saying we want to see this information from companies so we can actually make our own determination. We'll use our shareholder power. We'll actually vote against companies' accounts if they're not doing TCFD. Um, because, so therefore, it's very difficult for us to then say, but we won't, we won't do it ourselves. So I think that there is an element, it's not moral high ground, it's reality is, is that to really understand these risks, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, not a sectoral issue, it's a whole market dislocation issue on, uh, in terms of pricing or whether assets are properly being priced. So therefore I think you know, it's only right for us to, 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 to also be disclosing on our own basis. Our, our biggest problems are, uh, are not necessarily related to our own as a company or as individual companies, it's, it's the knock-on effects, but it's also where the sector or the wider economy is going. Kajitan, um, there is um, clearly a lot of firms that aren't disclosing and aren't modelling. Um, what tools are available and, and how do firms engage on this and ha how, do, you know, how do you learn? So, you know, I know uh, the Cambridge Institute uh, has developed some of these tools and perhaps you might like to speak about those and, and other, other resources available in the market. Yeah, yeah. Happy to do so. so so just, just to start off with, we are, we are talking about kind of climate risk tools. Um, so, so there was mention about ESG tools, um, which overlap with this field of, um, of, of expertise. ESG also includes things that are non-financial in their nature, some of them. So, so however, when you're looking at climate change risk from a financial perspective, there are mainly two architectures that are, that are currently in the market or currently being developed by, by companies. The first one is, is a bottom-up analysis, where you start from the asset, really, and look at um, both the regulatory uh, environment that it sits in and also the physical risk that, that, are, um, that, are, that, that it's exposed to. And I think, and I think you, you really touched on something important, that the, you know, the scenarios that you're looking at, on the one hand, are we will solve climate change and get to one and a half degrees, and then transition risk is super high, but physical risk is, is low. Or the flip side of we don't do anything, so the transition risk in the short term is low, but the physical impacts will be high. And reality in 2030 or 2050, and you know, as time goes on, will be somewhere in that balance. Right? So, so when you're looking at the bottom-up tools, uh, you really should be looking at um, how, in the different scenarios, 
your assets are being exposed. And a, and a you know, classic example is I know, energy efficiency standards um, for um, a, a big facility, let's say steel production, um, and energy efficiency uh, standards are coming in. How will that facility fare compared to its competitors in that geography, in that sector? Um, from a physical perspective, you can look at you know, changing rainfall patterns and the, the effect on the hydropower uh, facility, for example. So those are kind of bottom-up uh, models. Um, what's, what's very popular in the market now um, is also kind of top-down uh, models, where the assumption is we will achieve the commitments that have been made in Paris in 2015. They're very ambitious, one and a half degrees to two degrees. Um, so transition risk in that scenario is very high. Um, and you start off with this, um, with, with the, this presumption that that level of warming suggests a specific carbon budget. So we know how much, what is the, what is the uh, maximum amount, amount of carbon dioxide uh, equivalent we can emit to hit that warming target, and then you transpose that to uh, countries, to sectors, as they currently eat up uh, the portion they, they eat up uh, today, and you allocate those to companies, and then you look at what their targets, uh, what their emissions are today, and what their emissions should be in 2030 um, and, and beyond, and you look at their emissions uh, targets, and you see how they fare effectively compared to their, to their peers. So a very simple um, benchmarking exercise um, here. Now, uh, the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership, I know, has recently published um, uh, some material on this for both transition and physical risk. That material publicly available, I assume? It is indeed. So in, in, uh, in February, so, so uh, the Cambridge Institute uh, for Sustainability Leadership convenes uh, an industry group of leaders called ClimateWise, and Aviva is, is part of that group, has been from the very beginning, um, where we've, we, do, we have a number of initiatives. We started off with a disclosure initiative, which is uh, called the ClimateWise Principles, now aligned with the TCFD. So if you disclose against the ClimateWise Principles, you're immediately compliant with TCFD recommendations. We've also, uh, we also designed tools to help the market move forward. Uh, and in, uh, in February, we launched uh, uh, two open source tools, one on assessing transition risk, uh, which effectively uh, gives you a two meter long database of uh, how different assets uh, are affected on their cost and revenue side in different, uh, different transition scenarios, and also a physical uh, risk tool, which is mainly for NatCap model models and, and how those can be updated uh, with climate change scenarios. Because, as you said, these changes are nonlinear. The past doesn't quite indicate uh, future risks, and that's increasingly becoming true. Uh, and what we find is that almost all NatCap models don't refer to potential changes in, uh, in the risks that are um, suggested by climate change models. So maybe with the follow-up material um, from this session, we could m we'll make some links available to that, um, to that material, but it can be I found at the so. Cambridge uh, Institute for Sustainable Leadership within the Cam University of Cambridge uh, website, as I understand. Um, Suzette, can I deal you in? Um, uh, as a regulator um, in South Africa, um, what is, yeah, wh how do you see this from a regulatory perspective, both in South Africa and I guess more broadly, uh, your work with the CIF and the IAS? Um, you know, wh what's the regulatory perspective on, on the barriers or the impediments or the lack of understanding about the importance of disclosure? Uh, thank you, Jeff, and good morning, everybody. So just to start off by saying we in South Africa um, do know that we need to better understand climate risk and, and also understand why reporting and disclosure of that is, is critical. Now climate risk and climate um, events and extreme ev weather events has always been low in, in our country and in our region. Until recently, and we saw earlier this year when um, Cyclone Ida hit uh, Mozambique and, and Malawi, it left 1,000 people dead and um, cost off $2 billion um, in, in, in countries where most people are either uninsured or, or underinsured. I mean, that's close to us. Mozambique is one of our neighbors. Even in, in, in South Africa, um, we had the worst drought in 100 years um, from 2017 going into 2018. And it had a significant impact on our agricultural um, 
sector, particularly the small farmers and the emerging farmers that's critical for food security in, in, in the communities that they um, farm in. So um, we, earlier this year, did a survey to our insurance industry on, on the DFCD um, disclosure requirements with the main focus to see if, if um, the industry is aware of it, but also then to, to get an uh, indication of, of whether they are considering um, adopting it and, and disclosing um, the information. We decided to, to send out the survey to all our insurers. We've got roughly 196 insurers in South Africa, um, 87 life insurers and the remaining um, non-life, so we sent it to them all. We wanted to get a broad view on it um, from all the, the insurers. We've got a very concentrated market in the life sector. 80% um, of the market share is owned by the top five. And in the non-life sector, 75% of the market share is, is owned by the top um, 10, 10 insurers. So we got the survey back. Um, we had quite a good response, 66% um, by numbers and 85% by assets. Um, the people had various views or, or various results of, of whether they knew about um, these DFCD rec recommendations. Um, so 79 percent of the insurers expect climate change to have an impact on their business, um, and um, they do think there's some opportunity and that it will also change the market dynamics in South Africa. 41 percent indicated that they already report on, on climate risk. Um, but this was done mainly internally um, and, and not so much externally. And 12% of, of the uh, respondents indicated that they had made plan, plans to take steps to implement um, the DFCD recommendations. Now, getting to the challenges um, that, that we see in, in implementing one reporting and then disclosures as well. I mean, we are an emerging market in a developing country. Um, We've got a number of, of challenges, um, socioeconomic challenges. We've got huge unemployment, um, poverty, and inequality. We've got limited resources and budgets, and we need to balance our initiatives um, to, to see where it, where it needs to go. I mean, we're a fossil fuel intensive um, country. Um, about 90% of our energy is, is generated from the use of, of coal. So. Um, you know, to, to go radical might have a significant and a severe impact on our economy. I think the other thing is the lack of data and consistent data and granular data, um, a lack of expert knowledge in, 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 in our country to actually understand and, 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 you know, interpret the results, and then also buy-in from the leadership of, of the entities that, that we do supervise and consistency throughout the sectors that we supervise um, as, as well. So I think that's where I will end. I mean, you referred to a number of incredibly important issues there, um, societal challenges, economic challenges, transition, but you also referenced opportunity, which we haven't spoken about the, the, this morning. So, um, uh, I mean, Hugh, you've referred to the opportunity of being more proactive in, in, in this area. Um, I assume those opportunities around um, new products, uh, services, ability to engage with uh, your customers. I um, um, don't know whether any of the panel members, you know, climate, climate risk is often thought about as, as a risk. There's less coverage on the opportunities. I mean, there is a, uh, the panel before us talked about infrastructure. There is a huge uh, demand for uh, not only all forms of infrastructure, particularly green infrastructure that has to be financed, it has to be insured. Um, does anybody want to make a comment on, on that? Um, Kajitan, you look ready with your mic, yeah? I'm, I'm happy to, to, to just, uh, kind of two, two interjections. One is, ultimately every risk in the financial market is somebody else's opportunity. It's a, it's a mirror, I mean, so, um, and, and if you don't think that this is a way that you can generate alpha, then, you know, simply look at what happened in you know, the mid-2010s with the European utility industry that lost half a trillion uh, in assets. And there was, at the same time, actually WWF created a, a fund that was shorting um, the utility stocks, and it just skyrocketed. So that's an opportunity coming from a risk right there. Same thing with uh, U.S. automotive right now. I mean, Tesla is a climate change risk. Right?
it's a, it's a company that's effectively challenging the status quo and, and showing that it can make money um, out of a low carbon, a low carbon solutions. Um, so, so that's one element, but, but the other element is indeed uh, the, the new type of infrastructure, new type of assets, insurers being effectively um, long-term investors on the, uh, on the investment side, which, which links well with uh, low carbon assets. And th there is, there's a lot, of, a lot of figures in terms of how much money we need to invest to transition to a low carbon energy system. And I think you mentioned five times, I don't know where that, what that specifically relates to. But, uh, but if, you look, if, you, if you look at the IEA's numbers, um, uh, just on the energy infrastructure, um, they're, they're expecting that between 2015 and 2035, the world will inv invest in business as usual uh, scenario, $89 trillion in infrastructure. Okay. To move us to a two degree scenario, and maybe one and a half degrees, now that they've updated it, will be a bit more expensive, but um, that $89 trillion would have to be $92 trillion. Okay, marginal change, and that additional investment actually is paid off in subsequent decades from energy efficiency um, and lack of and, and lower use of fossil fuels. So actually, it's free. It's just we're allocating the assets to the wrong uh, type of type of infrastructure. Q. I mean, I mean, on two areas. I mean, transition has a threat, has an opportunity. There's a big low-carbon economy that's going to be, have to be funded. I think insurers with long-dated liabilities that are generally illiquid, we're uniquely placed to invest, as long as we have the right regulatory environment on capital, but I won't mention that. Um, but, the, uh, but, you know, if we, if we can facilitate that, we're incredibly well placed on that. Uh, it's interesting some of the stuff that we do with carbon data when you're looking at ranking and looking at different companies. I'll come back to pop. You know, there are, the, you, know you can track companies by the number of patents that they're basically delivering onto new technologies to get a sense of will they get a, actually plus an in, a, a, a kick to their revenue stream in the same way that the fossil fuel companies may be losing out. So there will be a shift in that economy. So there's that. I think from a consumer demand perspective, you know, I think the newer generation, not that I'm one of those anymore, in fact, sadly, you know, are interested in where their money is going. So the product opportunities at all are high. I mean, we're doing some products in France on electric cars, you know. Then you link it back to the last panel, you know, the rebuild opportunities on products that are going to help resilience on things. If you're smart, there are also opportunities. It, it's well documented that... Um <clears throat> climate change risk has a disproportionate impact on uh, you know, emerging and developing economies. Um, but I wonder if the f uh, there's also a huge opportunity as well, Suzette, um, with um, in Africa, for example, where energy infrastructure poles and rise are less developed, you leapfrog across that to localised um, solar installations. I, I'm, I know I've seen and read um, a lot of that is occurring throughout uh, throughout Africa. Um, you know, is that opportunity being appropriately embraced? So um, I, I think to a limited extent. I mean, we've seen in the insurance sector in particular um, a lot of these alternative investment funds being set up to fund wind farms and, and, and solar panel farms. Um, we also... Our non-life industry, um, where there's, there's geysers that needs to be replaced, they will replace it with a solar geyser. And, and, and a lot of people, um, I think mainly as a result of the challenges we had with our electricity supplier, um, we, we went through a, a lot of um, stages of, of what we called load shedding, where electricity was shut down for an hour or two in, in, in areas, that a lot of people that's building or or changing, renovating their, their houses, they would rather go for, you know, solar panels. But it, it, it's still a very expensive um, way to, to change. So, but there are definitely things being done, but um, at a very slow pace. So let's circle back to um, disclosure, because to make good decisions, you need good information. Um, so we've talked about... Um, the you know, apparent lack of maturity uh, across all sectors of the economy and not least of which is the insurance sector. So I want to go back to the audience, if I, if I may, and uh, ask for our next polling question, which is, uh, you know, I guess, given the maturity uh, that we have seen, uh, should disclosure become mandatory? The TCFD was a voluntary uh, framework. Um, should 
that be disclosure of climate change risk information be required by legislation in, um, in, in, in various jurisdictions. Very simple, one for a yes, uh, two for a no. So that is uh, relatively convincing. Um, uh, nearly 80 respondents, of which uh, 56 of the 80 <coughs> Uh, ag agree that that should be. Um, and certainly, if you, I talk about, um, uh, you know, in my own country, in Australia, while disclosure is not mandatory per se, um, we have the, um, uh, the Securities and Disclosure Regulator, ASIC, saying that uh, companies need to disclose all relevant risks. We have the Australian Stock Exchange saying that uh, you're required to do so under your governance regime. Uh, we have a very eminent legal opinion which said that directors could be held personally liable if they aren't uh, responding to their, their duties uh, as, as assessing and disclosing this risk. And, and as a prudential regulator, we are saying similar. So there are certainly, um, th there is a, a huge regulatory nudge on this, but uh, m in most jurisdictions, um, regulators have stopped short of, of um, of actually mandating it. Um, um, but just quickly on this, if I go to each of the panel, um, your reaction to those, those results, and are we on the eve of, given the lack of progress on this, uh, as would appear to be the case, are we on the eve of actually saying that disclosure needs to be mandatory? Mary Frances. Thank you. I I think the move will be to mandatory disclosure, but I wonder that if at present it isn't just a bit premature. Uh, I think that there needs to be more work on, on, on data quality, on data definitions, a common taxonomy, and then perhaps we can... Uh, Are those things linked? So to actually make that progress, do you, uh, you, know, do you need to force disclosure to flush those issues out? I'm not sure you need to force disclosure. I, I think that there are industry and regulatory efforts underway, and I think what you, you want to establish to the extent you can is a market agreed disclosure standard that has broad buy-in from both the users of, of disclosure, the providers of disclosure, and the regulatory community. I think at that point you'll, you can move from uh, the current more voluntary frameworks uh, to a, a commonly agreed disclosure standard and then uh, broad adoption. Well, let's come back to that in, in a moment about the future. Uh, uh, catch that? I, mean, I, I would, I would agree, agree with that. Um, I mean, if, if we are to make things mandatory, we, there should be a standard kind of explaining how do you go about uh, reporting so that the uh, the information that you get from various entities is comparable because that's the that's the critical element. Um, but I do think that it needs to be mandatory for the whole market to catch up because we're not there yet after 35 years of asking companies to disclose with you know the ISO standard, the green, greenhouse gas protocol standard. Um, and others because there is still a large group of companies that just don't disclose because they don't have to. Um, and it's almost the same as, you know, with financial disclosures. If, if the SEC said you, you can use, uh, you know, a, a financial reporting standard, but you can also just report uh, under your own standard, your own definitions of what quote-unquote profit is or quote-unquote weighted average cost of capital is, um, then those disclosures would just not be, ca not be comparable and the users of the, that information would not be able to integrate them into their investment and underwriting decisions and financial decision making. Thank you. Suzette? Um, to disclose or not to disclose? <laughs> yeah, I think um, we, we still away from... from deciding on to disclose or not to disclose. I, I think, you know, at, in, 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 in the near future, it is critical. But where we stand, as I said earlier, we, we still need to better understand the risk, um, you know, to make sure that, that the insurance industry's got a handle on this um, and that, that there's consistency in, in, in the disclosure, not only from the insurers, but also from the other financial sectors and that it's done by all. So, so if I can be a bit provocative and say um, 
ICP 16 requires uh, firms to um, address material risks and have a response to those those risks. Um, your disclosure is is another step beyond that. But um, as regulators, uh, should uh, should we be pushing harder on disciplines within firms to be modelling and at least internally disclosing the risk? Yes, definitely. And, and I mean, for us um, in South Africa, that that would be a big focus, one, to, to improve the internal um, assessment of, of the risk and the reporting, um, to include it in the OSHAS and the impact of this risk in, in, in the OSHAS, um, to get some supervisory reporting to us um, in a consistent manner, um, and, and also when we engage with the firms um, as part of our prudential engagements to actually have this as, as, as a topic. Um, but, but disclosure, it's good. It's always good to be transparent. Um, yeah. But I think we, we're still away before we will get there. Thank you. Hugh? I think on disclosure, you need to differentiate a bit. I mean, I think that the, to me, it is not all, the, the climate issue is not all about insurers or what we do. It is also about how we, we invest, other people find out, invest. So actually, it's not just about, TCFD was not just about disclosures of insurers, it was about the whole sector, the whole economy, that as an investor you can understand and you coordinate and you can make a judgmental decisions on stewardship, on how, how money is invested. And we're not the only investors on that, but we're a big chunk of that. So I think you mustn't lose the big picture that when we're talking about mandation, it was to allow clear, transparent information across all the companies that are operating in the economy. The second element is on disclosure or not. I mean, the thing about the TCFT, and this is what slightly surprised me about your survey, I wouldn't be surprised if people have said, I'm doing TCFD, but maybe not as much as everybody does. Because TCFD has got a number of elements. Yes. It has got governance. It's got risk management. Uh, we're getting a quite focused on the quantitative bit, but I'm surprised that more aren't giving it a go on the, you know, on, on the governance bit, on the risk a management part because generally people are required to disclose material risks anyway and so I don't think it's necessarily uh, I, I think that I would expect the pressure to be coming from the market in terms of listing authorities thinking about whether this is disclosed so I was expecting your survey to say lots of people are doing it but they're not doing the quantitative part I mean I'll come back later and talk about our journey the reason is it's flipping difficult to do the quantitative bit so basically if you make it that you've either got to do all or nothing, we have to get ourselves onto a journey on this. So you know, it would be good if people were starting to do uh, their, their risk management, were starting to do their governance, how is it being considered, and recognize that some large and small companies have different positions, different economies are in different places. But if we could get the journey to get more people, that to me means that what you don't want to do is to come out with the world's most complicated disclosure, quantitative requirements, and then say everybody must do it. I think we need to get onto a journey on this. That's a very good clarification. So, um, so just if I just wrap that up, then we come to the forward looking. So, as I understand what you're saying, it's a reminder that TCFD uh, is a number of elements: governance, strategy, risk management, uh, analysis, and metrics, and then the disclosure of that as a package. Um, so. Um, and certainly I know in um, my own country in Australia, we have found on the work that we have done with firms that governance strategy and risk management, particularly with the larger, more sophisticated firms, is quite evolved. But the metrics analysis and the disclosure of that is less evolved. And I think it comes back to the points that we've been talking about on the panel, that this is, as you said, I think you said it was very hard. So, uh, so what do we do about this? Like, how, how do we accelerate this effort? Uh, so before, we'll turn over to the audience in a, in a moment to get some engagement on this, but let's finish our discussion on just what does that look like in a forward-facing... Uh, forward um, how do we make progress, Hugh? I mean, if, I, if, I, if I just give you a bit of an example of, kind of like the journey that we ourselves have been onto... onto. So for, for us, you know, since, since about 2000... Since 2004, we've been external... Our own carbon, carbon from, footprint has been disclosed since 2004. So we, there was that, and then since 2006, we've been neutral on rebound, and then we set our own targets, and, and, and we have our... So we have basically our TCFD, and that includes a number of elements. Some of it is our own carbon footprint, where we've made our own commitments and our own targets to reduce our own element. Uh, then the next thing that we looked, looked at was um, uh, very much the... 
which is parts of TCFD, is the carbon footprint of the credit and equity portfolios that we're doing. And that's talking about the, uh, the weighted average of the carbon intensity of what you're invested in. That's relatively more straightforward to do. Uh, and we've, we, we issued it last year, we've issued it this year as well. Um, we're also looking at disclosure on the liability side, but on the asset side on that, you can do that. Now, personally, we found that quite nebulous to say that a company has X or Y carbon intensity. We basically work with, uh, we've been working with um, uh, uh, Carbon Delta to turn that into uh, more something user-friendly, which is takes that in temperature into the, to a, temp a temperature metric, which is like a, a, a portfolio warming metric. So a portfolio war war a warming metric is basically saying what, uh, if the companies were invested in carry on like that, what's the trajectory of how close you get to the two degree Paris Agreement? So we've disclosed this year, for example, in our metric that if you took our equity portfolio, uh, if you look at the ones we're investing in, we're at 3.4, FTSE's at 3.9. We're positively trying to invest in things which have a lower trajectory. Um, same, on the, uh, same on the credit side, we're 0.2 below the, 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 the benchmark on iBox. That kind of like suggests that it's very, very difficult to invest in that, and you need something other than us to do something about it. So to us, the fact that you know, we're, we're positively engaging um, to invest uh, directly, but the fact there's a gap would suggest actually you need enormous government action, because if the FTSE isn't going to move, you have a bigger problem, which is carbon pricing, carbon whatever. So that's, that's the second, third journey we've gone through. What we've done this year in terms of looking forward is, is that we've introduced um, a climate value at risk measure. Now that is going through the four scenarios I mentioned at the outset that uh, has come through, and it's saying, let's underlyingly look at our assets, let's look at our liabilities, let's have a look at under what scenarios, what will be the likely impact on our shareholder fund looking forward in terms of capital generation, um, under each of those scenarios. And it's got a probability assessment, so we're assessing probability. So we're looking at the 5th to 95th percentile. We're saying, what, is, what are the likely scenarios that that leads to, to for us, a 15-year time horizon? And in doing that, what that's really basically shown us very clearly is, is that if we go for the, the, the most likely scenarios are 3 to 4% in terms of probability outcome. But if you look at the range, if we get to the 4%, as Katrin was saying earlier, then you're dominated by physical risk. Uh, by physical risk, but underlying that physical risk is also the fact that the economy is all tank, so you can't invest in anything. So it's not just about flooding. I mean, for an insurer, you've got one year time horizon for pricing. You can get through year by year by year, which is uh, the your peer firm uh, AXA. The CEO famously said last year that a four degree world was uninsurable. And of course, for us, we got one year. We can reprice as things get worse on the on the P, uh, on the PNC side, and then you will. And we think that the ultimate thing will think things will become uninsurable because you just won't at that level. So that's where physical risk dominates. You do get an element of that onto the life side in terms of impact on health and morbidity as well. But that's the dominant feature is the physical side. Then you get to your 1.5 uh, uh, scenario on us. And, and that's the only one for us where currently you see an upside because that depends where you invest on the transition side. And on the transition side, it's very much dominated by the investment portfolio type side. You know, and it's the speed of that rate of change which is impacts. So, you know, we're trying to do, to try to do that, and we're looking at the various, and we do the tails, well, not the tails, we basically say what are the most likely outcomes for us under each of those four scenarios, and then we aggregate it. So, for us, that's where we'll look to. It is very challenging to do. We have a very large team that are doing that, whether it's Catch Channel or getting a lot of, we're doing that in conjunction with the uh, uh, UNEP uh, FI. A pilot as well, and there are a number of other insurers doing something similar as well. We've chosen to disclose for the first time, but you know that is to me the future, which is sophisticated scenario analysis. You can't expect every company to do that at this time. So, so um, a free plug to Aviva here. Um, if our members of the audience wanted to go and look where that material was, where, where would they find that? If you look on our website under sustainability, given the fact I have only got one copy of this. <laughs> Um, um, and uh, yeah, have a look under our, go to aviva.com under sustainability, and we basically have one which is the large big book on the TCFD in terms of the VAR analysis and stuff. You know, we kind of got all our metrics in a kind of like a four, four pager. Thank but you. that is that last one, which is the VAR analysis, which yeah. is 
which is the big step we've made, tried to make this yeah. year. So I want to throw to the audience in a moment, but um, if we just continue on this theme of future-oriented and, and how, we, how we make more progress on this, um, uh, Kajitan, can I come to you, then Suzette, then Mary Frances, uh, before we throw to the audience here? Yeah. Sure. Um, well, the first, first thing about the future that I see is that uh, regulators are skilling up, and they, I do see a lot more regulatory action. I mean, you know, regulators have called this a foreseeable systemic blind spot that the industry is not taking into account. Now, those are some pretty heavy words coming from uh, you know, macroprudential regulators, and, and, and you know, having said that, they will say something else. So watch this space. The second thing that I, that I wanted to, to just highlight is that one of the, one of the um, suites of tools that, the types of, types of tools that you have available to you are, are the open source tools. So, so the, the tools that you know, we've developed through ClimateWise, I do have some copies of the reports if people would like to take them with, with them. Um, but there, there are others. I mean, uh, the Two Degrees Investing Initiative uh, also came from uh, an EU grant. The, their methodology uh, is open source. Um, CDP, which is now 20 years old, around measuring, measuring uh, carbon emissions, which is slightly different from carbon risk, climate change risk, but it's also uh, open source, value at risk, designed by uh, the car uh, Carbon Tracker Initiative, also an open source methodology. So, so you can't say that you don't have the tools available or that it costs a lot to develop them because they're developed and they're online and you just need to download them. So that's, I think, I think a future. And the other thing that um, open source uh, uh, methodologies uh, give you is that you avoid this black box issue. So the gentleman from uh, giving, uh, giving the... Uh, the brief remarks around the uh, Japanese insur insurance forum mentioned uh, mention that that black boxes are an issue. Yes, they are, because if you don't know what's inside the box or ca how the numbers come out, you don't trust it, and if you don't trust it, you won't implement it. So, so, so this is the whole idea behind promoting open source methodologies is that they're free, they're scalable, and they're, they're, they're understandable. So... Um, so I think that's, um, that's definitely uh, the future. Another thing that, there, there are two, two, el two other elements uh, that, I, that I see. We haven't really talked about liability risk, which underpins both the transition and physical risk. Ultimately, there are arguments, and there are actually uh, a lot of lawyers running around trying to pin this down uh, in terms of the obligations of companies and states already embedded in existing legislation. Right? If, if you can be proven to run your company recklessly under no, with, uh, with, with what we know today, which is you're, in, you're running a portfolio that's driving us towards a three degree world, um, regardless of what the benchmark says, that could be argued as management running their company recklessly. Okay, and that obviously touches and, on- And there is already a fair tranche of cases being prosecuted. Uh, Indeed. Indeed. So, so that, that is something that I think we're very close to a tipping point in terms of more and more cases coming out and uh, more and more, especially boards, being taken, to, uh, taken to, to court. And the last thing that I just want to say is that this is very urgent. We're, we're in a very, very... This is the last chance that we have to solve uh, this problem. Because in 10 years from now, this isn't a linear, linear trend. 10 years from now, the feedback loops of the environment will start emitting so much uh, greenhouse gases that humanity's emissions will just be negligible unless we stop that from happening. So this, the, the, the window of opportunity to address climate change, and uh, as we've seen from the IPB ES report uh, a few months ago, also species extinction and biodiversity loss, if we don't stop this within the next 10 to 15 years, we can stop worrying about it, but also we'll be we'll have to deal with massive physical risk, ecosystem services uh, collapsing, and ultimately, you know, I think it's quite an obvious statement to make, but you can't do business on a dead planet. Right. Well, that's pretty blunt. Suzette? Oh, so I did mention earlier that, that our focus is to increase awareness um, going forward enhance our reporting. Um, we also would like to, to um, send the survey that we did earlier this year on the insurance sector to, to the banking sector and the, and the market infrastructure sectors that we also supervise. 
So, um, you know, we would like to, to enhance our supervisory reporting, that we get a consistent manner of reporting, um, in, engage with the firms around it, put it as a topic of, 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 um, on the agenda. But we've, what we've also seen, and, and, and I mean, we as supervisors, I think, to have a role to play is, is for the industry to, to get some initiatives going. I mean, one thing is the, the understanding of the risk and, and, and the impact thereof, but we've got a big risk protection gap in our country and in, in our region. So um, industry, together with government, um, can, can do a lot of initiatives to mitigate and manage um, the risk and also to, to resolve or make an impact on the, on the huge risk protection gap. And just to give you a few examples, our um, non-life in industry um, is actually getting involved in, in planning and building codes, um, you know, in the setting thereof. Our, uh, they're also supporting a number of communities by providing them for with disaster training and, and disaster tools. So, you know, we, we've got the small communities, they um, went to the fire brigades, um, you know, gave them training, helped them with, with the equipment. Um, and we also, um, I did mention it maybe yesterday, um, that government together with, with the, the industry is working on an index insurance product, specifically focused at protecting um, the, the commercial and emerging farmers. It would be, we hope that it would be launched as a pilot project later this year. I think we as supervisors need to be um, aware of it, one, be able and flexible to allow it in, in, in our regulatory um, framework, so we need to be agile enough. But, I mean, we still need to predict the policyholders at the end. Thank you. And I, I'm going to throw to the audience in just a moment to ask what su their views on what supervisors should be doing, um, which you, you referenced. Um, but before I do that, uh, um, and before we go to questions, Mary Frances, um, how do we accelerate? I think the future state of, of disclosures is, I, I think we're moving in the, in the correct direction. I think that uh, there is increasing awareness. I think, as Ketchin mentioned, the availability of open source tools should really help firms uh, uh, take positive steps towards, towards better disclosure. As Hugh mentioned, you can always start on the qualitative and talk about uh, your board oversight, your management's role, uh, how you integrate uh, these uh, climate-related financial risks into your strategic planning and your business decision-making, and, and, and start, as, as Hugh properly uh, puts it, start the journey uh, towards uh, climate-related financial disclosure. And I, I think that there will, be, there will be a movement in that direction. I think there will be a bit of peer pressure. Uh, I think there will be regulatory pressure, which I think is... is, is is warranted as well. And uh, I think that firms will also see the opportunities and the competitive advantages of, of making these disclosures and being more transparent and, and meeting the needs of their, their investors for this, for this information. So that's good advice. Um, and get ahead of the curve. Uh, Absolutely. So, um, last polling question, um, uh, and Suzette referenced this. Um, I'm keen on your feedback on what role does a standard setter such as IAIS have as it relates to climate risk and seek your guidance um, in this last of our polls before we go to questions. So what do you believe is the most important role for the IAIS can play on, on climate risk? Well, I think we're... Um, we're doing the second, which is good. We're doing it right now. <laughs> and guidance for members, we have done that with our first issues paper and we uh, plan to issue a second issues paper later this year. Financial stability, um, less of a, an issue and thankfully the last two didn't really rate. So I'd like to, yeah, I think Suzette on behalf of... Uh, IS, I think we are, um, that broadly aligns with the SPFO and our, our engagement um, uh, and our plan going forward, which, uh, as was referenced yesterday by Vicky and Jonathan, was, was published yesterday, and you'll see references to, um, to this being a core area of focus for us over the next um, coming period, over the five-year plan, um, 
and the issue which we've discussed today, a dominated discussion on disclosure, uh, you know, it feels like uh, it is inevitable that uh, there will be um, more, more mandating of, of, of disclosure given the existential nature of, of, of the risk. Um, but as Mary Frances points out, there's a lot firms can do to get ahead of the curve um, uh, that going forward. So thank you for that feedback. Uh, I now want to uh, throw to the audience, we've got uh, about 20 minutes left for questions, which is, is welcome. There are mics around the room. Who wants to kick us off? Yeah, just, I'm sure, there we go. And um, if you just say that again, thank uh, you. Callum Tanner with the Association of British Insurers. Um, for disclosure, could you, we just talk about uh, supply lines and how, um, uh, I guess, the supply chain of companies and how that uh, should feed into disclosure? I guess that's uh, a very difficult area, thinking about how uh, different companies are um, not only directly um, carbon intensive, but in terms of their supply chains. Thanks. Yeah, Callum, that's a great point. And we, we um, not, not only is, is this not as mature as it should be, but often where there is disclosure, it's on first order effects, but the second and third order effects uh, are, are, are less well developed. Um, does anybody want to want to tackle that? Uh, um, Hugh? Yeah, I think um, it's complex to do, and we've, we're looking at how to do that in the context of our climate var analysis where we're going more direct than indirect, although we realize that we want to do more of it. When it comes to ourselves, we do do that. So when we disclose our targets, we're looking at a direct supply chain impacts as well already. So when we've disclosed our target to reduce to 60% from 2010, which we've met and we're going to go again, we're also looking through to our supply chains. So that's why our knowledge building is basically self-sufficient on energy and things like that. So, you know, you, you can do some so This is not just, um, it's the supply chains for the insurers themselves and then their clients, right? So an example might be a partnering facility in the Philippines uh, where you've got admin and claims or call centres that is taken out, what does that mean? It might be, what does that mean for your, your firms, right? We are doing that because actually when we look through to, we do direct and indirect, particularly on the, where we're investing as well. So actually some of, the, some of the analysis that you can get is not just looking at direct impacts on flooding, it's also looking how do, so we're doing that when we're looking at the companies that we're investing in, it's not just direct, how do they knock, where does that go, go through to? Hedgetan, the um, climate-wise work, um, second and third order effects, supply chain. Um. So, uh, I mean, the, the methodology is at an asset level. Um, so the, if the one applying the, the methodology knows what the linkages are between that asset and its supply chain, then you can also assess the supply chain. Although it does, it does also cover, for example, things like um, gas distribution pipelines as an asset, which obviously um, is part of the supply chain of a gas power station. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is possible. Um, I think it does, it does always create a level of, additional level of complexity, um, but I think in many sectors that are heavily reliant on, um, on their supply chains and, the, and, the, and the, the diversification in suppliers is low, um, that is a necessity. One of my favourite examples on this is the Tha uh, Thailand floods uh, going back some years, which took out a, um, a component manufacturer. And so a lot of people said, well, that's a terrible tragedy in Thailand, the floods. But this, this particular factory um, manufactured a component for European, um, a number of European car manufacturers. Um, all come, came from the one, uh, one factory. And that took down uh, the European car uh, plants for, you know, a period of time. And uh, then that, of course, raises issues around uh, business interruption insurance, uh, liability, the cascading effect that has on, uh, on other related suppliers, et cetera. And I suspect those sorts of risks are not well modelled or not well under understood. And they have to date been seen as one-offs. Um, but, uh, you know... There seems to be a, a very high frequency of one in 100, one in 200, uh, one in 500 year events that uh, happen on a regular basis. So thank you, Callum. Next question. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, Morik Falada with Full Love Consulting Group. I, I guess I have two questions, really. One is the European Commission has just released a fairly detailed taxonomy uh, on disclosures, and I'm wondering how the panel feels if that is a guideline uh, for use. And the second thing is, um, you mentioned, and I think it came up a couple of other times, the, uh, the attractiveness of your company at, for getting investors, you know, by having the disclosures. And I wonder if there's a, how much substance that has as the insurance industry looks to attract investors, not just the investments which we make. Thanks, Mark. Um, Hugh? Yeah, if I take the letter one, because I can remember that. I couldn't remember the first one more, because you'll have to remind me the first one. I think on the... Uh, it's interesting, because in the context of things like the Geneva Association, it's not just an individual company. I think it's the sector. I think generally, as I said, and Mary Francis and I have, you know, the, the insurance sector plays a key role, a societal role, in, and I think it's often underplayed and not understood. So I do, I think, that actually this is an area where we should be positively championing what we can do, because whether it's protection gap, whether it's resilience, whether it's things, and you've seen that with the IDF, and I think what's been really positive is the original Argentinian initiative and then the Japan around the G20. I think people are now... We've always been a slightly dull, quiet industry, but actually we have an incredibly fundamentally societally important role to play, and in this sector as well. So I don't think it's just about an individual company trying to get credit. Uh, I think it's actually sectorally wide incredibly important for us, reputationally, not least of which, because we're probably not high up in the list of trusted, <laughs> well, very low down the list of trusted. Uh, uh, of, of, uh. So I think actually championing that wider good is, is actually very important for us. And we've got very mutual interest in that from the... And a lot of these issues, I would say, I think at some point there the were comments made about the pressure from the regulator. I think that there's an incredible amount of mutual interest mm. on this topic between companies and the regular, both on that side. So come back to your first question, Morag, which I've just now remembered. Uh, the, uh, the, yeah, there is a lot of, uh, I think in a European context, there was the high-level action plan that's going through to regulation. Most of that is just very common sense. I mean, I think for a lot of companies, this is about risk management. It's folding it through to the author, as Suzette, Suzette said, and stuff like that. So it's actually, it's actually getting this embedded within companies. To my mind, it's a, it's a best practice thing to do that. In a UK context, apart from, you know, the Bank of England have been very active and where there are a lot of dual committees on a climate task force that have been set up to look at scenario analysis, to look at these things. So I think hand in hand, there's a lot of good work that we can do. So a real leadership opportunity for the industry, Mary Frances. Yes, I just wanted to comment on the EU taxonomy. I think this is a very positive development. I think it will really, really help to, uh, to create a, a common language for, for climate-related financial disclosures that will, that will help uh, firms with risk management as well as, uh, as, well as disclosures. So I, I think that that's, uh, that's a very uh, positive development. It, it's something that can be, can be very difficult to, uh, to kind of get your arms around. So I, I think that that's, uh, that that's certainly a very commendable And do you see work. this as sort of scaffolding to support the TCFD? Does, does, that, does that taxonomy fit within the TCFD framework around metrics and analysis? Yeah, it, it should. It, it should support the metrics and analysis. Again, it is, as you say, a scaffolding uh, that will support not only the disclosure, but also the, the internal risk management, the internal discussions that firms need to have, and also the discussions with the regulators. I think it can help facilitate those, those conversations with regulators. And I think I'm correct in saying that uh, some of those initiatives are now starting to be uh, embedded within the European Parliament. Um, uh, others might be closer to that than I am, but I, I, I understand that's the direction that's going. And yeah, thank you. We have time for a couple of more. Uh, there's one towards the back of the room. Thank you. Yeah, just to devil's advocate for a second, just to follow up on Morag's question. I'm um, I'm wondering if we can get a clear view from the panelists. Um, Part of the EU's effort, I think, involves kind of um, taxonomy to specifically identify what's green, what's brown, what's light brown, light green, and this kind of effort. I'm wondering, does that kind of um, structured process make sense to you all, or should it be more market-driven? I'm kind of curious what your thinking is on that. I'll, I'm happy to have a go and firstly speak on behalf of the IAIS, um, so 
referred to in uh, this morning's panel by uh, Manuela, and it was also referred to yesterday um, at uh, Exco Forum. Um, I, I mean, one of the challenges is is classifications of assets, and there, you know, I think on the infrastructure point, uh, going back to John Huff's panel this morning, the, the you know, there is currently a very crude approach to how we think about. Uh, you know, what is infrastructure, let alone the classification within infrastructure. And uh, if we are to mitigate and if we are to make the uh, quantum of investments that uh, are needed, then uh, that has to change. It has to change very, very quickly. But i um, uh, interested in, in other thoughts. So, so I think uh, it does address a very critical barrier in the market for development of green assets. Um, I, before, before I took on this role at CISL, I worked with uh, the Climate Bonds Initiative in developing the green bond markets in Brazil and India. And whenever we were talking with a potential issuer, their number one or number two question was, but how do I know what's green? And how do I know if your framework of defining green, which by the way is almost exactly like the taxonomy, because it's mirrored on the climate bonds um, uh, standard. Uh, how do I know that your taxonomy is green enough and somebody's not going to come to me and say, but that's not actually green, you're greenwashing. Um, and, and rather than this being, cre creating an asset that's attractive to investors, they create a lot of PR problems for themselves. So, so that distinction is very, I think, critical. And, I, and, and it will actually, even though it's, it's a bit of a, uh, uh, a bit maybe annoying an additional uh, you know, reporting requirement, uh, at the end of the day, it will allow uh, greater transparency in the market, which I think is necessary in, in, in this spot. Um, I think an additional comment that is, is often being made is, well, isn't this, isn't this a bit like saying, okay, so these assets here are good, but these assets here are bad, but they're still legal? And that's quite confusing. Um, but I think it's important to just step back a bit, quite far back actually, but um, just bear with me, and, um, and understand that you know, since the free market economies in general are very kind of purpose agnostic, and I'm not sure how many people are familiar with Isaiah Berlin's writings about positive and negative freedoms, but he basically you know, divided the economies into two factions, one that are ideological, like communism, where there is a very clear purpose to society, and then the people that disagree get thrown into gulags. Um, or the second type of um, societies that have negative freedom, which is you know, the West, where there isn't any ideal and everybody does whatever they want as long as they don't do illegal things and the role of government is effectively just to keep the peace and make sure that the lights are on. Um, we're now in a situation where that second form won globally, roughly, but it's causing a number of externalities that have to be dealt with. And we've now actually, in 2015, come back to trying to set some sort of purpose to the global economy, which is embedded in the Sustainable Development Goals. So the purposes are have life underwater, protect life on land, have a stable climate, have equality, and so on and so on. So those are goals that um, we're, we're trying to aspire to as uh, a, a global community. Now to do that, you have to somehow distinguish what assets and activities are part of the solution and what type of activities and assets are d detrimental to achieving that goal. So I think you need to put the line somewhere and to do that you need definitions. Thank you. Hugh, do you want to add? I just add three quick comments. I wouldn't underestimate the challenge of trying to agree a taxonomy. Politically, in different countries have different views on different things. So that will not be a straightforward process to achieve. I think, secondly, it then comes back to what do you do with that? I think a good and a bad view of the world is not sophisticated to an investor who could influence a bad person to become good, because actually the bad driver's on that. So this idea that you get too black and white. I think the third thing is basically what do you then do with that? Uh, that probably links to your earlier panel, was does it lead to any differential treatment of those? I think as a minimum, what you should be is creating an environment that facilitates long-term investments on things like infrastructure, because we find there are barriers to that, you have a problem. So I think those three I would link through in the train on the design of a taxonomy. And of course, that is all a given. The great challenge is that time is not something we have as it relates to this risk. 
But as a company, we're not waiting for a taxonomy to determine how we're going to put our money. <laughs> so, so that's an interesting point. Um, uh, the, you know, the world has operated on the basis of um, today to global standards, um, you know, and thing, as things potentially uh, are more fractious uh, on, on that score, are there other mechanisms like uh, consumer um, consumer action, uh, community action that actually don't wait for global bodies to agree things and negotiate things, you know, it does, does the... If you want me to get controversial, the fundamental minding on the asset prices is the tragedy of the horizon, that the market is dislocated, not pricing things properly. The only way that you're going to address that is not individual companies, is government policy maker action to bring in something that basically gets that distortion adjusted. Otherwise, the market will act like the market. So we will play our part, but there has to be a broader, a broader governmental action that actually makes these things happen. Because in the absence of that, we're kind of like slightly playing around with the margins on a taxonomy, in my view. The MC is standing, which uh, is, uh, is a sign, but it does say we've got a couple of more minutes, Connor. So, so. Uh, and we have a question at the front. Thank you. Olaf Jones from Insurance Europe. Um, I think I was actually going to make a comment, but it picks up on the, uh, what Hugh was saying. It, Just put the mic a little yeah. closer. Thank you. I think it picks up on what Hugh was saying, but because it, it clearly it, insurers uh, have a, a role to play in terms of their, their, the way they can direct their investments into uh, preparing for climate change and adapting, adapting the economies. But it seems as if this is just a part of, of the solu policymaker solution because there simply aren't enough sort of green assets, I think, to invest in. So uh, as Hugh was saying, I think something more needs to be done to trigger the, the, the type of investments so that the insurers and others can act actually have the effect that's desired. Um, and I think that sometimes the f there seems to be an over-focus on, on the taxonomy and things like that and maybe less focus on the other parts of that puzzle. And linked to that also, is, and that was coming up in a, in a panel before, there, there seems to not always be a direct connection with the need for uh, closing the, the coverage gap, making sure that, that the resilience is there so that, again, insurers can play their role in helping people cope with the changes that, that may and are happening um, in terms of uh, making sure they're covered for, for uh, extreme events. And I think that some sort of, um, sort of more uh, holistic policy making in that respect, I think, would be helpful as well. They are all good points, and I would respond by saying that um, better disclosure and better information on the risk and how the risk is materialised, both in physical uh, um, liability and transition risk, will help accelerate some of the need for those investments. Um, uh, but I think that your point is, was well made. We're just out of time, uh, so I just would like to, on behalf uh, of the panel, um, firstly, thank you for your questions um, and engagement and feedback through the polling. Uh, perhaps if I can make a couple of summary comments. Um, I showed at the start of this session the, the work that we have done uh, at the Sustainable Insurance Forum in partnership with the IAS on surveying some 1,200 insurance firms. Uh, the Sustainable Insurance Forum and its members are meeting for a full day uh, here tomorrow, and we'll be looking at some of that analysis. We're looking to engage with industry, likely in the third quarter around se September, on what we've learnt and what some of the responses are, picking up some of the themes here, and certainly today's panel has been very, a very useful engagement tool feeding into that. It is our uh, desire to publish uh, this second issues paper on uh, these issues that we have discussed today on maturity of the insurance sector as it relates to uh, the TCFD uh, disclosure framework. Uh, I also wanted to highlight that uh, there is, again, on a related topic, uh, the Financial Stability Institute as part of the Bank of International Settlements in partnership, again, with uh, the Sustainable Insurance Forum and IAS, is working on an insights paper on uh, scenario testing and modelling of insurers as it relates to uh, climate financial risk. And it is, again, uh, our desire to publish that uh, paper at the end of the year, so that will be a useful tool for industry uh, as, as a whole. Um, uh, and I think my last point that I need to sum up on is, uh, is try and pick up uh, a series of tweets that, uh, that have, um, have been 
perhaps captured from the, the panel. So I think I heard um, uh, hashtag uh, blind spot, uh, hashtag climate wise as a resource, uh, hashtag action now, um, hashtag uh, mandate disclosure, um, hashtag TCFD, um, but perhaps I'll finish on um, uh, Kajitan's uh, uh, provocation, which was hashtag you can't do business on a dead planet. Please join me in thanking the, plan the panel. Thank you very much.